Welcome to a lecture on Ukrainian national identity and Russian intelligence failure with Ethan Berger, hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. To support our work, please visit iwp.edu slash donate. Our speaker today, Ethan Berger, is an instructor and, and advisory board member for IWP's Cyber Intelligence Initiative. He is a Washington DC based international attorney and educator with a background in cybersecurity, transnational financial crime and Russian legal matters. He has been a full-time faculty member at the American University um, with the School of International Service Transnational Crime Prevention Center and the University of Wollongong in Australia, where he was on the Faculty of Law with the Center for Transnational Crime Prevention, as well as an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University Law Center, Washington College of Law, and the University of Baltimore. He oversaw a program on transnational crime and corruption for the US Department of Justice at Yaroslav Modri uh, National Law University and gave lectures in Kiev, Lviv, and Odessa. Mr. Berger earned his JD at the Georgetown University Law Center, AB from Harvard University, and obtained a certificate in cybersecurity strategy from Georgetown University. Welcome, Mr. Berger. Okay, well, thank you very much, Katie, for the introduction. I just want to start off by mentioning that the current predicament that Russia finds itself could be in large part attributed to the arrogance that the leadership has towards the concept of Ukrainian national identity, as well as its failure to, at a technical level, use uh, command control and communications things to uh, deal with battlefield situations. Now, just as a quick uh, reminder, if you look at the map of Ukraine, you can see that to the east, you have the Russian Federation. Directly north, you have Belarus. And on the left, you have Poland, and then Hungary, and then south, you have Romania and Mold Moldova. And this sort of will give you some indication of the outside influences on sort of perceptions of the Ukrainian population currently. But it's not as strong as a lot of people assume. In the past, people had always sort of assumed that people in the East were sort of looking towards Russia for you know, their identity, and people in the West were more EU-focused. This type of uh, division has been breaking down in recent years. Now, to understand the historiography of Ukraine, you have, you know, in the upper left, I have the Russophiles, which are the people who viewed Ukraine as part of the sort of Russian imperial framework that you have the Russian Empire and uh, the different states that made up the Russian Empire. Underneath that, you have the Sovietophiles, who basically are the outgrowth and sort of the post you know, revolutionary uh, form of the Russophile community. Upper right, you have the Ukrainophiles, who basically thought of Russia as being not significant to their national development, and that Kievan Rus, you know, Kiev itself, was the capital of a larger Russian empire, and that you know, Russia started you know, far after, like 700 years after Kiev and Rus was founded. And the last group is the Eastern Slavonic people who are sort of anti-Russian in outlook and um, view Ukraine as possibly a buffer between Russia and the other states and the prototype leaders or former presidents, Kravchuk and Kuchma. But with respect to the basis of the history, which sort of overlaps with the prior slide, there are different um, 
types of approaches that could be used in looking at how countries develop and whatnot. You have the historical prism, which has sort of an anthropological, archeological, economic, historical, and ethno-linguistic approach to trying to figure out the evolution of Ukraine. But also not to be ignored is the whole idea of the importance of individuals on the development of history. Then you have the ethnographic prism, which has somewhat of a similar uh, approach as the historical prism, but the whole idea of consciousness is much more emphasized of the people. Also important to keep in mind is the fact that Ukraine's borders throughout history have moved and the composition of the people within Ukraine has changed so that when you use a term like Ukraine, it has to be understood within historical context uh, and borders and the people that you're talking about. For example, the Rusini are people who are sort of in Western Ukraine and they uh, at one point were largely understood as the Ukrainians. And uh, anyway, I'll we'll just go to the next slide. But this gets to the question of when does Ukraine's history begin? You have 1882, where Prince Oleg founded Kievan Rus. Then you have in 1654, where you know, the Cossacks were having you know, basically border skirmishes with the Poles. And eventually, Bogdan Khmelnytsky reached an agreement where he agreed in exchange for some autonomy to look to Russia as being the principal uh, power with influence in his territory. Then in 1917, 1918 through 21, you had this interaction with Poland where you know, there was the Russian invasion of Poland. And then you saw different things where the Poles would make claims to Ukrainian territory in the West. And you know, that thing played itself out over a while. Prior to World War II, you had different Ukrainian national groups organized and arming themselves. And that was you know, in conjunction with what was going on you know, with the Germans. Then also significant is the role of famine in leading to the concept of Ukrainian identity. Basically, about 3 million Ukrainians died of, of famine uh, as a result of collectivization. And this further uh, pushed Ukraine into having a greater sense of necessity of you know, a national sovereignty to go their own way. And then you have more recently the Belosia Accords, which is upon the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus signed these agreements, dissolving the Soviet Union and recognizing the formation of independent states, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus, and Kazakhstan subsequently joined that uh, period until the rest of the constituent republics of the Soviet Union broke up and became independent of Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, et cetera. And as I mentioned, Ukraine uh, once 1991 came about and, and Ukraine, uh, they picked their own president and you know, first Kuchma was the president and he surprisingly lost to Kravchuk. I'm sorry, he surprisingly defeated Kravchuk. And uh, and that reduced the sort of splinter for a while between Eastern and Western Ukraine and, and reduced the importance of language as dividing the country, but did not eliminate it. Other important concepts to understanding you know, Ukraine and how it sort of differs from Russia and how uh, Russian views of Ukraine uh, may not be on point is 
Ukrainians have this concept of chromata, the idea being that uh, you have decentralized authority that at the municipal level, whereas well, Russia tends to be hierarchical. That is, they're, they're bottom, they're top down. Ukraine is bottom up. And so that, whereas Russia at the very top, the, the country is organized into federal districts. Uh, in Ukraine, you have localities which are self-governing to a great extent. And so you have people who take on responsibility who have uh, financial and other responsibilities locally uh, to a degree that you don't find in Russia. And so that, you know, for example, uh, people have looked at the present situation with Russia, hoping that the oligarchs could somehow pressure you know, Putin to call off the war. Well, the fact is that the oligarchs you know, basically do not have that type of power. Whereas in Ukraine, the political leadership is much more dependent on the wealthiest people and they could, those people could influence the state. Uh, back to some history, um, Ukraine's national identity really started in, in Western Ukraine under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Ukrainians were referred to as Ruthenians in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a multinational empire, which permitted the Ukrainians to have their own schools, whereas the Russians sort of felt that that was uh, a threat to the unity of the empire. And they sort of viewed uh, language as furthering the likelihood of the breakup of Russia. Now. Once the Soviet Union was established, it was established along you know, ethnic lines in theory, but those national lines were largely symbolic uh, to a great extent. I mean, everyone was expected to have Russian as the lingua franca, be able to operate in Russian, though they permitted schools to be taught or to be teaching in the local language. With the passage of time, particularly after 1991, Ukrainians started thinking about themselves in a different way. And the idea being that to be Ukrainian with the passage of time meant to be uh, Ukrainian of origin, that is, of nationality, as opposed to the, the Russian ethnic or hereditary terminology. And that the concept of Ukraine and Ukrainians became more closely tied to civic concepts, the idea being that you were a Ukrainian by citizenship. And so that with the passage of time, uh, Ukrainians as an ethnic group in terms of like Russian concepts became less important. Now, if you look at Ukraine geographically, whereas Western Ukraine, the people there tend to be, you know, historically ethnically Ukrainian, Ukrainian speaking, the people in the Eastern part were typically ethnic Russian, Russian speaking, but also there's a lot of intermarriage. And then the central part of Ukraine, the people may be bilingual, they may be ethnically, principally Ukrainian, but they would speak you know, Russian at home, certainly speak Russian at work, uh, so that the importance of language in recent years became less significant in Ukraine, and that this type of situation was not properly appreciated by Putin and his principal advisors. Uh, this is just some historical things that Ukraine had to develop sort of a national history, you know, after 1917, uh, after, you know, in the 19th century, so that there were Ukraine historians who had to, as it were, create sort of a national, I want to say myth, because it was based in 
true history, but the idea being that it had to work counter to the history that the Russians were trying to have the Ukrainians accept as their own. The idea being that there had to be uh, Ukrainian history taught in the schools, and the idea being that Kiev and Rus is the foundation for Ukrainian identity. Bringing us more currently in 2014, this is really the key historical or key contemporary situation for when Ukraine got sort of a, a civic identity, a national identity, as opposed to an ethnic identity, which is that in 2014, uh, Yanukovych, who was then the president, who was considered to be pro-Russia, started having second thoughts about Ukraine joining the EU. And because he thought that it would jeopardize Ukraine's closer relationship with Russia, the, the Russians were not eager to have Ukraine in the, in the EU. And so about 100,000 protesters went into Independence Square, the Euromaidan, and there were also demonstrations countrywide. And then this led to violence. And the appearance of what were referred to as the little, little green men, they were armed volunteers without insignia, some of whom were possibly from Russia, a lot of them came for, from other countries in Eastern Europe, et cetera. And, and then subsequent to that came the occupation of Crimea, uh, the Russian uh, encouragement of Luhansk and Donetsk as different political entities. And the Russians, even though they did not move Russian troops into Eastern Ukraine, did support the movement of Russian hardware into Eastern Ukraine. Uh, getting back to the idea that Ukraine, to a much greater de degree than Russia, is concerned about the preservation of national minority rights. And what's interesting is though uh, Ukraine is uh, essentially less diverse nationally than Russia, uh, they do more than pay lip service to the importance of recognizing uh, the rights of national minorities. And so, that's worth knowing. These are some interesting things with respect to poll data done in 2019. Uh, if you look at Eastern Ukraine, when people are asked to identify their first way in which they think of themselves in terms of their identity, people who are who identify themselves as fixed Ukrainian Russian is 12%. People from Donbass who said them, they were themselves residents of Donbass as being the principal thing was 13%. Then people who said that they were Ukrainian citizens was 26%. People who said that they were ethnic Russians, and that's a very, I mean, it's a very low level, much lower than, say, Mr. Putin would have expected, 7%. And then people who said that they were ethnic Ukrainian as it being the dominant identity is 29%. So if you see 29%, the largest group, then Ukrainian citizens 26% as the second largest group, and ethnic Russians would be the smallest group. Even if you look in separatist controlled lands, only 12% thought of themselves principally as ethnically Russian. You know, it's a very small percentage, but much smaller than uh, the Russian intelligence people would have thought at the time. It's not quite clear the degree to which academic studies may influence uh, Russian thinking and Russian policymaking. And this is just a discussion of what 
the preferences were and within the uh, government control parts of Donbass, 31% wanted uh, some type of autonomous uh, position within Ukraine. Then 65% didn't see the need for autonomy. 2%, only 2% wanted to be part of Russia fully and 2% wanted to be part of Russia with autonomy. Now, with, the, with respect to the separatist parts of Eastern Ukraine, uh, those numbers are a little bit higher. 27% wanted autonomy within Russia, 18% wanted fully to be part of Russia, but still a majority, if you look at the top two groups, that's 55%, they wanted to be part of Ukraine. Now, a lot of people have uh, heard about you know, this article, which allegedly Mr. Putin wrote, which I'm sure was ghost written by a lot of people, where he advances the idea that there was a historic unity of the Russian Ukrainian people, and that really there's no reason that Ukraine should ex exist as a separate country, which is the uh, rationale for the military, the large military operation, which is currently underway. Uh, and as I showed you earlier, there's not a tremendous amount of historical basis in support of this position, but obviously it is politically driven. One of the people who is very influential on uh, Mr. Putin is this guy, Alexander Dugan, who is sort of the right-wing intellectual, intellectual parent of Putin, who sees there being no reason for a separate Ukrainian identity. And so with the idea that Ukraine and Russia are one people, it's important to know that Putin's use of language is not terribly precise. He defines everyone who lives in Russia and Ukraine as Russian. Uh, he doesn't really acknowledge the separate history of Ukraine prior to the Russian Empire. He tends to think that the Russian Orthodox Church is superior to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Uh, he tends to downplay the idea that Kievan Rus uh, was significant for for Kievan for Ukraine history, history as opposed to simply uh, Russian history. It sort of he sort of starts Russian history much later. Uh, let's see, anyway, the last thing isn't terribly important. Uh, another thing which is I think kind of interesting. Uh, and it has to do with the mythology of, of Ukraine and national identity. Um, the idea being that many Ukrainians, they think of the Cossack state as being an important historical beginning. The idea being that you have sort of warrior history uh, of Ukraine before it fully joined up as part of Russia. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, this is kind of surprising. I mean, the Cossacks uh, are not, you know, are not understood by most people as being so important to Ukrainian identity. Uh, but with respect to the willingness of Ukraine to fight, it has an important mythological quality to it. And this is just some imagery in terms of uh, Cossacks. But I found this interesting that it was really the Cossacks who popularized the term Ukraine. I always thought Ukraine you know, was, it comes from Russia and meaning at the edge of the Russian empire, but that's in fact not the case. Also, we should know that Russia had their own Cossacks as well as, as, well as Ukraine because the borders are not necessarily uh, curly uh, 
defined and having political as well as real consequences. This painting is very famous, but. And for national identity, it's kind of interesting just to, a lot of Ukrainians thinking of themselves as their identity is simply that they're not Russians. Over here, you could see where Donetsk is and Kharkiv and Crimea and Eastern Ukraine there. The age cohort is a very important thing to consider because you could see the aging of the population in Ukraine, the people who are sort of Sovietized or sort of the upper age cohort. And the larger people are people who were born or educated after 1991. And so they have a very different worldview than say their, their parents. Uh, and, and so that this is one of the reasons why uh, people were sort of surprised by the willingness of Ukrainians to bear arms. And we'll, we'll get this in a little bit more later. Another thing to keep in mind, and a lot of people will discount this, there is some basis for the Russians to constantly refer to Ukraine as being sort of uh, influenced by Nazis and the sort of that playing an influence in, in Ukrainian history. And as I said, this is very complex. So I'll get to this later, but there were individuals who were allied with the Nazis during the invasion. There were also uh, this group, the Azov Battalion, who were like right-wing nationalists who were based in Ukraine, uh, who armed themselves and you know, fighting against the Ukrainian government. And so that this is not to be dismissed out of hand as having no basis at all, but you should be at least aware of it, that it's not as if Ukraine has a perfectly uh, vanilla history. And uh, anyway, share that. But getting back to the complexities of this, during World War II, somewhere between 600,000 and one and a half million Soviets, both Russian and non-Russian, joined the Wehrmacht to participate in the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. In fact, these forces constituted 20% of Soviet, sorry, of German manpower in the Soviet Union. So a, a large share of uh, German forces were non-German, were Soviet forces, and uh, over 180,000 Ukrainians participated in this effort. A large number of these volunteers uh, either were in combat, were in rear line security, and involving and were involved in uh, anti-Soviet partisan act actions, et cetera, and were involved in staffing concentration and labor camps. Um, another thing which is interesting to note, the red, and this is demographics in terms of understanding how Ukraine changed over time, uh, the Red Army in 1941 constricted males ages 16 to 17, and they tended not to be very well trained or armed. And a very large, in the, actually the majority of these individuals were killed in combat in a very short time. More than 5 million Ukrainians fought in the Soviet army, and a fifth of Ukrainian males were killed during, sorry, every fifth of Ukrainian male was killed during World War II. So that is a very, very large loss of life in Ukraine as a result of the war. Also, 
keep in mind that since there were Ukrainians who were fighting on the side of the Germans, as well as Ukrainians who were in the Red Army, you have families that were fighting on, on both sides during the war. But overall, World War II had a tremendous demographic effect on Ukraine. Uh, they lost overall about 14 million people. And another impact of this was that the Russian share of the population really increased. So Ukraine became more Russian, less Ukrainian after World War II. Here, people are probably familiar with this map. Uh, this shows the five uh, ways in which the Russian forces sought to advance uh, into Ukraine in the recent conflict. You know, you see the approach to the north to Kiev, the approach northeast into Kharkiv, then uh, east. And one of the major things that they were hoping to do was create a land bridge between eastern Ukraine and Crimea. And then eventually we'll see spread out south, possibly to connect to Moldova. In Moldova, it used to be a republic within the Soviet Union. Uh, and this is a pretty frightening thing for the Moldovan population because they really have no uh, well-established military. But as I showed on the previous slide, uh, Well, before the conflict started, a lot of people who were looking at uh, the pre-conflict diplomacy assumed that Putin was like a rational actor and he would focus his effort on Eastern Ukraine. I mean, and that the West sort of bought into the idea that Eastern Ukraine was somehow different from the rest, rest of Ukraine and that the people there would welcome some type of uh, autonomy within the Russian Federation, or at least understood that they were not really Ukrainian like everyone else. Uh, and so it was really kind of interesting, the effect of Putin's article and, and its impact on sort of Western politicians and diplomats and the intelligence, because they sort of discounted the idea that there would be an assault surrounding all of on, on all of Ukraine's border with Russia. And so that once it was understood in the early days that that in fact what was going was going to happen, the idea that this was going to be a precursor to some type of ethnic cleansing, the idea being that there would be enough people who would be accepting of Russian domination that we have a situation similar to what we saw with respect to former Yugoslavia. So also keep in mind that the Donbass region is the principal economic prize within Ukraine. And so you know, there's a lot of mining and industry and whatnot. And so while that may have made sense to be the principal focus you know, for Russia, once you accept the idea that Putin and a lot of the people within the Russian sort of military national security elite didn't really accept the idea that Ukrainians are a different nationality. Uh, the idea that ethnic cleansing was inevitable, I think should be uh, understood. So something else which is to be kept in mind and kind of, kind of surprising a lot of people in the West are surprised that the Ukrainians have fought as well as they have. You know, and the thing is, NATO has been training Ukrainian forces for more than eight years. And the Ukrainians have gone into these units where they've been trained, 
and then released to the population as a whole, so that once they were mobilized, they had more troops with combat experience than the Russians had, which is sort of counterintuitive. Uh, and so that the idea that once the lines become somewhat stabilized, uh, that Ukraine could somehow survive became uh, accepted more. And the question was, would Ukraine have enough you know, artillery uh, and equipment and stuff to withstand a better armed Russia, which whose morale, whose forces morale would be lower than Ukrainians who are de defending their own country. So that generally, Putin's advisors did not really understand the population that his forces were fighting against. He didn't really understand that after your Maidan in 2014, that Ukraine actually had sort of a citizen army who had a civic identity where the whole concept of ethnic identity was much less important, that the Ukrainian armed forces became more sophisticated technologically and were more experienced with computers than the vast majority of the Russian people. And then, the, and lastly, just the underestimation of Zelensky's ability to rally the country, because the idea being that if they had a decapitation in Kiev, if they simply were to land troops at the airport and push into Kiev, that they would be able to find fifth colonists with whom to co collaborate and rule Ukraine. And that was the original plan. It was sort of not based in reality. Anyway, so I guess we can go to q and I sort of jumped around a lot. Um, Katie, do you want to take it from here? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Um, we have one question um, here, which is, um, prior to the invasion, did the majority of Ukrainian Jews self-identify more as Ukrainians or Russians? Uh, I'm not sure of the answer to the question. I mean, there are about 200,000 Ukrainian Jews, a large, I would say the majority of Jews that were resident in Ukraine uh, upon the breakup of the Soviet Union emigrated to Israel, the United States. Uh, Zelensky is a non-observant Jew. It's actually kind of interesting. The secretary, so the minister of defense and Zelensky's chief of staff are both are all Jews, uh, but I'm not sure that that question has been asked by some of the uh, people who conducted the studies that I have looked at. I mean, the fact that if they had not left, that would give you some idea of how they might identify. Uh, anyway, I could just, I really don't know the answer to the question. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have a, another question, which I'm going to try to paraphrase, which is, um, what sources do we have to know that this invasion was really going to come off and wasn't, you know, leading up to it, that it wasn't just a lot of saber rattling and gathering forces along the border. Um, and the the asker of the question um, is, is arguing that perhaps our response could have given, you know, of, of saying that Putin would invade could have given Putin a green light to invade. So if you have any perspective on that, um, that, that is the question. Well, first of all, uh, what Putin was doing, I mean, what the Russians were doing was shared publicly by US and uh, British intelligence. And the movement of Russian forces uh, was self-evident. And uh, it's while the people who make the argument, and like John Mer Mersheimer and whatnot, that 
that Putin mm -hmm. believed that there had been uh, a representation that the Baltic states would not be brought into NATO and that there'd be no deployments east of what had been East Germany uh, made Putin have a sense of encirclement. Uh, there's an old saying which even a paranoid could have enemies from his, his standpoint. But I think that there's really very little that NATO did to bring this about, and they were trying to bend over backwards to prevent it from being necessary. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what is the most accurate source of news from Ukraine at this time? Um, what should non-experts be reading and watching? Uh, I always like looking at Radio Liberty, uh, you know, RFERL, which is it's sort of paid for by the United States, but it's independent. Uh, BBC News is good. Uh, Deutsche Welle is good. There are, Deutsche Welle and France 24 have live television all the time. Uh, and they have a lot of Ukrainian coverage. For American things, I always watch the PBS NewsHour. Uh, but there's an overload on different sources of information. But once again, I think the best is Radio Liberty's Ukrainian coverage. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, what do you think the attempts of the Ukrainian government to ban Russia as a uh, to ban Russian as a language in Ukraine had on this situation? That has never happened. They've not banned Russian as a language. Uh, actually, uh, there are all these Ukrainians who, like on television, saying that they don't know where these stories came from. Uh, whatever. I mean, that's something that Putin would like you to believe was done. I mean, Zelensky had to study Ukrainian as a language because he's a Russian speaker. Uh, I mean, and that, you know, I've, I've worked as a lawyer with people who are ethnic Ukrainians. And I used to think when we were working, when they were speaking to me in Russian, they were doing that as a courtesy. And they told me, well, well, I really don't know how to practice law using Ukrainian. All right, thank you. Um, where where do you see the out, the outcome of this conflict, given your cultural understanding? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> absolutely no idea. I mean, there's so many uncertainties right now in terms of whether if Ukraine gets more armaments, whether they could stop the Russians somewhere close to the border. Also, the possibility for a settlement has largely vanished given the war atrocities. I mean, it's hard to see how Zelensky could sit down with Putin given the fact that oh, there have been so many war crimes. Um, and it's hard to see how you know, Biden having called Putin you know, a war criminal and all this type of stuff. Once you put that out there, the wiggle room for reaching a settlement is reduced. Uh, and one could fantasize that there might be like a palace coup or something like that to eliminate Putin, but there's very little uh, basis for having that expectation. So that you know, this can go on months. If, uh, Absolutely. Um, and to, to kind of build off that question, um, one of our alumni is wondering, you know, how, how does this all end and how does it play out in, in particular for long-term U.S.-Russian relations? Uh, it's, once again, it's hard to see how U.S.-Russian relations will get better so long as Putin is in charge of the country. Uh, I mean, because it's the level of trust is is rather limited. You know, a lot of Putin's legitimacy is to exaggerate the external threat and what they've taken to do on their media is in essence to say that the United States is behind Ukraine and really that's 
why we're fighting this war. We're really fighting the United States. We're really not fighting the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians couldn't possibly uh, defeat us. And the other thing which is going on, where you have Norway and sorry, Sweden and Finland coming into NATO very likely in the near future, it will just exacerbate uh, Putin's sense of being encircled, which of course will reduce the likelihood that Russia will feel like it will be possible to settle this conflict. Thank you. Um, the next question is, do you think a more vigorous Western response to the annexation of Crimea would have discouraged the latest invasion? Uh, I don't think it would ha have been so credible. Well, first of all, I don't think there would have been support to have extreme or severe sanctions against Russia at that point. Also, the Ukrainian military was not really capable to, to do anything much other than withdraw. And the Ukrainians made very good use of the time after the fighting really in, in Donbass to the present to get their military up to snuff. And uh, I don't really think that the situation in Crimea could have gone otherwise. Great, thank you. Um, what do you see as the possible solutions, if any, in the near near term and medium term? I think the best thing that they could hope is just to have a, a ceasefire of some sort uh, with like Russia withdrawing to more or less what people expected the original objective to be, that they go back to uh, Eastern Ukraine, to the Donbass region. And then at that point, uh, perhaps have some you know, referenda to try to figure out how to have local government so that you don't have like Russian annexation, but you have some, you know, more official autonomy, but I don't really think the local population will vote the way that Ms. Mr. Putin wants. Uh, and so it's really hard to see any type of solution other than a ceasefire. And if you look around the world, there are lots of ceasefires. You have, you know, in Korea, there's been you know, a ceasefire since 19, was it 1953, and there's no war. Uh, and so I think those types of sort of frozen pieces or frozen wars are really the best possibility. And then perhaps with change in government in, in Russia, there could be some political arrangements done. But once again, given the war crimes, it's very, very hard to see how the Ukrainians and how Western countries can uh, really negotiate with Mr. Putin. Great, thank you. Um, would NATO membership be an effective deterrent to future Russian invasion? NATO me membership for Ukraine? Yeah, I believe so. Yes, sir. Well, in essence, that's where you're at, except for the fact that uh, The NATO countries are very much afraid of uh, escalation. I mean, the thing is, and they're, I mean, they're terrified that Putin will do something rash and whatnot. So I don't really think it's credible to bring Ukraine into NATO. I really don't think the Ukrainians at this stage would get more than what they're getting right now, which is far more than anyone thought they would get. I mean, they're being very well armed. Uh, I don't think the United States is willing to send troops to defend Ukraine. I don't think any other country is either. Uh, I don't think we can expect any other country to really militarily defeat Russia. I think the next important fire point will be Moldova and and 
try to, to the extent possible, uh, make it clear that we will take military action of a more extreme nature and economics action of a more extreme nature if they say take Odessa and head towards Moldova. And following up on, on that, do you foresee any of the Baltic countries uh, joining NATO as an after effect? I'm sorry, can you, do you think this is an after effect of that? Uh, of, of this whole situation. Well, I know once again that Putin believed that there was representation that the Baltic countries would not be brought into NATO. And then the question is, well, if Russia is not going to attack them, what do they care? I mean, psychologically for those small countries to survive, they have to have a sense that someone or some countries are backing them up. And so um, I think their stability depended on NATO membership, just like it depend, depends on EU membership. Um, we have another question, if you're willing to keep going, sir. Sure, sure. Um, how does the relationship between China and Ukraine potentially impact this war? What do you think of the potential impact of what seems like a realignment of former US partners, Saudi Arabia, India, China, on the outcome of this war? Well, I think the importance of this war with respect to China really relates to Taiwan. And I think they're look, looking at it, that very closely. I mean, Taiwan is not a country. You know, it's not in the UN. You know, only a limited number of countries have diplomatic relations with them. And uh, they will probably be focusing very closely on what Taiwan does to improve their international connections. I don't think that China wants to be uh, tied too closely to Russia. I mean, economically, one of the most amazing things is that California has a higher, the equivalent of a higher GDP than Russia does. And China recognize, China has a larger trade relationship with the EU than, than with the United States. So their economic future is not with Russia. And their technological future is not with Russia. And the only uh, thing that they have in connection with Russia is sort of the political uh, system, as it were. But they can't be impressed by the performance of the Russian forces and their failure to adequately uh, use technology. And so I think Russia may hope that China could possibly serve in some mediator capacity, but I think that's misplaced, that, that help. With respect to the Saudis, I mean, the Saudis are going to try to play this the best they can, realizing that they and the Emirates are the best alternative sources of, uh, you know, petroleum. And uh, I think that will limit the ability of the United States, you know, to pressure, you know, Saudi Arabia to make any progress on human rights type issues. You know, human rights issues will have to take a, a backseat to economic concerns. Thank you. Um, uh, we have just a few more questions. One is why is no one encouraging UN peacekeepers to be formed and deployed into Ukraine? Well, I guess the first thing is that Russia is a member of the Security Council, so they could veto any resolution coming out of the Security Council. And while uh, the UN you know, human rights body could make investigations, well, not in, U in Russia, certainly. They, I mean, they can go to Ukraine, but in Ukraine, controlled territory, it's largely going to be symbolic, anything that the United Nations does. The UN uh, has very limited uh, powers, and it's largely 
uh, one of persuasion, and Russia is not going to be persuaded to do anything that it doesn't want to do. Great, thank you. And um, just one last question. I know that you touched on this a little bit um, with explaining how this could possibly end in a ceasefire, but is there a conceivable off ramp for either side to kind of get there to that point? Well, first, uh, if you just look at the paper today, you know, Putin has said that he's not going to meet with Zelensky, and Zelensky essentially says that you know, he cannot meet with Putin so long as uh, the whole war crimes thing is not resolved, so long as you know, his country is being occupied to a great extent. Uh, so that they, they would have to find some country, and it's hard to think of one that could set up a ceasefire type arrangement, which would be acceptable to both without the leaders of both countries directly speaking to one another. And I, I mean, the closest situation, I guess, is the Koreas, where the leadership doesn't really speak to one another. And I don't think when the uh, armistice went into effect that there was direct negotiations between the Koreans. But we've had, you know, peace on the pen peninsula for a long time. Uh, we don't have, though, North Korea occupying South Korean territory. So it's a different situation. I mean, you do have situations where you know, countries occupy the territory of another state, but you don't have uh, like a hot conflict, which then goes cold with such important territory being held. All right. Um, thank you so much um, to Ethan Berger and to all of you who joined us today. If you're interested in attending other upcoming events, making a gift to IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please visit iwp.edu. Thank you again and have a great evening. Thank you very much.